Well, I do want to wish everyone a happy Father's Day, especially our dads. <laughs> well, it's for everybody, though, right? Uh, Mitch Album wrote a Father's Day article titled, When Did Fathers Become Expendable? And he described an exchange on The View. A guest host, an actor named Terry Crews, had proposed the idea that there are some things that only a father can give you. Well, this brought an onslaught of objection, both on social media and the set. And when he said, a father gives you your name, co-host Whoopi Goldberg joked, oh, like in The Lion King? When he said, a father gives you your security and your confidence, co-host Jenny McCarthy, who's raising a son on her own, shot back, I'm a single mother, and I guarantee you, I can give all those things. The debate went on for several minutes at a high volume, with a female host paying homage to widows, single moms, and gay couples. And McCarthy hammering at the idea that her amazing son needs no man. Album pondered how far we've come that on network TV, a man suggesting there are some things that only a father can give you is greeted not with a green nods, but with cannon fire. He offered the following analysis. What does a father bring to the table? I can cite a few things I got from my own. Strength, quiet confidence, discipline, responsibility, and love. All displayed differently than my mother, which was fine. My father also taught us how to be a husband, how to respect a woman, when to lead, and when to support. It's true, not all men are like my dad, but plenty are. And fatherhood did not suddenly, after thousands of years, lose its value. It may be trendy to dismiss dads as little more than fertilizer, but it's not true. In fact, it's pretty foolish, such as our world, where a comet like Cruz brings a tsunami. The funny thing is, I remember someone from my childhood frequently saying, he needs his father to do that. It was my mother. So thank you to all the dads who take your role seriously. Well, today we continue in our series, Seeking God's Glory. It is a series on the life of Moses. And as we looked at last week, Moses' beginning was quite unusual. He was lucky to even be alive. Uh, the Israelites were increasing in number at such a fast rate. There were more Israelites than Egyptians living in Egypt. And as a result, the new Pharaoh became paranoid that they would revolt and rebel. First, he made the Israelites slaves. And then he commanded the midwives who were delivering the Hebrew babies to immediately put the baby to death. It was a boy. Fortunately, they ignored the edict. Next, Pharaoh declared every Hebrew baby boy should be thrown into the Nile River. And sadly, many parents obeyed. Moses' parents did not. They kept him hidden for three months. And when they could not keep him a secret any longer, his mother placed him in a basket, which he waterproofed, and then placed the basket in the Nile River. His sister watched at a distance to see what would happen. Pharaoh's daughter came to the river to bathe. Uh, she saw the basket, and so she had her servant go retrieve the basket. And when the princess opened it, the baby was crying, and she felt compassion on him. Moses' sister then came out of hiding, and she asked, Would you like me to get one of the Hebrew women to nurse this baby? And the princess said yes. So she went, and she got her mom. So in the end, Moses went back to live in his home until he was weaned. During that time, his mother, Jochebed, which her name means, glory of God, instilled in her son a desire to seek and honor that glory. And when, that, when the time came for her to keep her word and, she, and return Moses to the princess, she took Moses to the palace where he would live as a prince until he was around 40 years of age. And then his life changed dramatically. Have you ever wished you could have a, a mulligan or a do-over in life? Or maybe just in that moment? I was talking to a ministry colleague recently, and he shared one of those moments. Uh, Bryce was in the middle of a painting project, and he went to rinse his brush. On the way, he passed his wife, who was working remotely, and she was on a call with her boss. As he walked behind her, he heard her boss kind of stop in mid-sentence and then continued on. Bryce thought, well, that was odd, and so he pondered it while he's washing out his brush. 
When he came back into the room, her call was over, and so he asked, were you on a Zoom call? Yes. Was your camera on? Yes. And in that moment, he wished he could have a do-over because when he paints, so as not to get paint on his clothes, he paints in his underwear. Well, sometimes our desire for a do-over is simply a matter of pride and embarrassment, but other times it's because our decision has just opened the door to regrets and circumstances that they really, we really don't want to deal with. And that's where Moses finds himself. So I touched briefly on the incident last week, but today I want to look at warning signs that we are not seeking God's glory. Let's pick up in Exodus chapter 2, verse 11. It says, Many years later, when Moses had grown up, he went out to visit his own people, the Hebrews, and he saw how hard they were forced to work. Again, Moses has grown up in the palace, yet because of his mother's influence, he identified with the Hebrew slaves. And because of her influence. Still today, parents are the biggest influence in their child's life. During his visit, he saw an Egyptian beating one of his fellow Hebrews. After looking in all directions to make sure no one was watching, Moses killed the Egyptian and hid the body in the sand. Again, up to this point, Moses has lived a blessed life. He was a Hebrew who was announced or who was sentenced to death by Pharaoh, but instead he grew up as Pharaoh's grandson. Rather than living the life of a slave, while the other Hebrew boys his age were working their fingers to the bone, Moses was just attending the best schools and he was uh, going to glamorous social functions. His life was blessed until the day he killed the Egyptian. And afterwards, his life would never be the same. This morning, I want to look at how we can avoid similar pitfalls, and Proverbs has a lot to say about this. Proverbs 13, 16 says, Wise people think before they act. Fools don't, and even brag about their foolishness. I think we all know people like that. Four verses later, Solomon writes, Walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with fools and get in trouble. Proverbs 14 says, the wise are cautious and avoid danger. Fools plunge ahead with reckless confidence. Then I want to share my favorite one. Proverbs 25, 28 says, a person without self-control is like a city with broken down walls. A person with, without self-control is like a city with broken down walls. In other words, when we don't have self-discipline and we just do whatever we feel like doing in the moment, like a city without walls, we invite the enemy to come in. We have no protection. So we invite him in to pillar, I'm sorry, to pillage and plunder whatever he desires. You know, people often look back on their lives and they'll say, this is not at all what I envisioned. How did I get here? And usually it's because they did not follow God's word and they did not see God's glory. Instead, they sought their own path while ignoring his advice. So let's read about Moses' downfall again. During his visit, he saw an Egyptian beating one of his fellow Hebrews. So Moses saw an injustice being carried out, and he wanted to stop it. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. It's actually the right thing to do, to, to step in and help those who are being mistreated. After looking in all directions to make sure no one was watching, Moses killed the Egyptian and hid the body in the sand. Moses was, was not simply defending his fellow Hebrew, nor was he acting on impulse. His actions were premeditated. Yet in all of that, God gave, gave him a, a, a warning sign. Moses, you are on the verge of making a foolish decision. It's a decision he knew was wrong, but he wanted to go there anyway. In fact, it's a warning sign that we all get. Probably a warning sign that we have all ignored as well. And yet, if we heed the warning, we will save ourselves a lot of heartache, embarrassment, and unwanted consequences. Anytime we find ourselves looking around to see who's watching and who's going to know, most likely, we are on the verge of stepping out of God's will and into our own. And that is dangerous territory. And I say most likely because I'm sure Moses' parents looked around often to see who's watching and who's going to know about this baby. Why? Because they knew that to save their son's life was the right thing to do. 
But Moses knew to take the Egyptian's life would be wrong. That's why he had to look around. Moses' parents were seeking to save a life while Moses was seeking retribution. So let me say it again. Anytime we find ourselves looking around to see who's watching and who's going to know what I'm doing, most likely we are on the verge of stepping out of God's will and into our own, and that is dangerous territory. I mean, think about it. Most addictions begin in secrecy. The alcoholic drinks in secret. The drug addict hopes his family won't find out. The porn addict goes on the computer when no one is around. Gamblers, shopaholics, every other addiction all live secret lives. And yet, secrecy is not just for addicts. I remember the day I was riding with my son in his car. He hadn't been married very long. We stopped for gas, and he threw out his trash, which included an empty donut container, I think is what it was. And he said, don't tell Casey. My heart sank. Because I knew where he learned it. I had done it for years. But I also remembered in that moment when my secret came out. And when it did, Debbie felt so betrayed because we were on a very tight budget that we had agreed on. And so I'm out spending gas money uh, on pop and candy bars and pizza while she's going to work eating a half of a yogurt, saving the other half for the next day. And so what we think is no big deal... Satan will definitely use to his advantage. And we think, oh, it's no big deal. It's just a couple of dollars. But to that other person, if you're hiding this, what else are you hiding? And when your trust is broken, you become untrustworthy. And Satan will use that in big ways. So whatever it is that, that we are trying to hide, it's not worth it. Not only does it break trust and it erodes relationships, we are opening the door to Satan. We are opening the door to say, hey, come on in and wreak havoc in my life. One day, we will look back on our life and we will say, how did I get here? It's because we ignored the warning signs and we were living a secret life. So the first warning sign is looking around to see who's watching. But here's the thing. If we heed the warning, it will build a fortress around our lives that Satan cannot penetrate. However, if we do ignore it, we will tear down those walls and we invite him in to pillage and plunder as he pleases. The second warning sign is trying to cover it up. Anytime we find ourselves trying to cover up our actions, we have already stepped out of God's will and into dangerous territory, and we need to repent as soon as possible. Verse 12, after looking in all directions to make sure no one was watching, Moses killed the Egyptian and hid the body in the sand. Moses looked around to see who was watching. Rather than listen to that, that warning going off in his head, he plunged forward and he took action. And then he realized, I have to hide the evidence. So Moses buried the body in the sand thinking no one would ever know. And yet rarely does that happen. The next day when Moses went out to visit his people again, he saw two Hebrew men fighting. Why are you beating up your friend, Moses said to the one who had started the fight. The man replied, who appointed you to be our prince and judge? Are you going to kill me as you killed that Egyptian yesterday? And then Moses was afraid, thinking, everyone knows what I did. And sure enough, Pharaoh heard what had happened, and he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in the land of Midian. We may hide our sin for a while, but eventually... The truth does come out. It did for Moses, and it will for us. Listen to what Moses later wrote in, in Numbers 21. You may be sure that your sin will find you out. Solomon warned, God will judge us for everything we do, including every secret thing, whether good or bad. Until we face it, it will eat away at us. David knew that all too well, and he wrote in Psalm 32, Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those who, who, whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt, whose lives are in complete honesty, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. When I refused to confess my sin, my body wasted away, and I groaned all day long. 
Day and night your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Finally, I confessed all my sins to you, and I stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord, and you forgave me, and all my guilt is gone. Anytime we find ourselves trying to cover up our action, we have already stepped out of God's will and into dangerous territory, and we need to repent as soon as possible. The Bible talks a lot about repentance, and it means to turn around, to live differently, to change your course. Ezekiel proclaimed, repent and turn from your sin. Don't let them destroy you. Jesus said, Prove by the way that you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. A lifestyle of repentance demonstrates that we have surrendered to Jesus and we are living for his glory and not our own. So what does repentance look like? It's a new heart. It's a change in our attitude and in our actions. And as a result, we come out of hiding that our life becomes an open book. We have no secrets. James wrote, Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that, so that you may be healed. And here's the thing. Satan's lie, which I think many of us buy into, Satan's lie is there is freedom in secrecy. And that, uh, that lie allows him to continue deceiving us. But true freedom and true healing is found when we live in such a way that we have no secrets. You're not worried about being found out. That is freedom. So if we're struggling in a particular area and we're hiding it, we need to find an accountability partner that we can be totally honest with, and we need to make sure it's not someone who's going to validate our sin, who's not going to minimize our sin, say, oh, that's okay, it's not that bad. That's not, your, that's not the accountability partner you want. You want someone who's going to say, that is wrong, I'll pray for you, but you need to know that is wrong. Moses did not heed the warning signs, and his life was forever changed. He went into hiding for the next 40 years. The good news is, God did not give up on him. And the same was true for you and me. God still has a plan for us. Do you have skeletons in your closet? God can still use you for his glory. And you'll find freedom if you will come clean. Do you have areas right now that you need to repent of? Trust it to Christ, and he will give you the strength that you will need. Yes, it is very scary to confess. Confession can open the door to unwanted pain and consequences. In fact, the truth is, things may get worse before they get better, but if you confess, they will get better because you are doing it God's way. And the sooner we get real with ourselves, with God, and with others, the sooner we will experience his transforming power in our lives. I want to close with a passage of Scripture that gives the secret to experiencing the power of Jesus in our lives. And it, it ties into the Scripture Ken read already this morning. When he talked about uh, putting off all of the sin that entangles our lives. When I think of all this, I fall to my knees. This is from Ephesians 3, by the way. I don't think it's on the screen. Oh, it is. Perfect. When I think of all this, I fall to my knees and I pray to the Father the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I pray that from his glorious, unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust him. Your roots will go down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. And then you will be made complete with all the fullness of God and power that comes from God. Now all glory to God, who is able through his mighty power at work within us. So three times Paul talks about the, God's work is being done within us. It's not around us. We always think he's going to do it around us. The work is when he does it in us. Now all glory to God, who is able through his mighty power at work within us, to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. Notice the process. 
that we fall to our knees and we humble ourselves in the presence of his glory. We ask him to empower us with inner strength. And as we do, it says, Jesus comes in and he makes his home in our hearts. But also, his level of power in our lives is determined by our level of trust and our level of obedience in doing it his way. The deeper that we allow his roots to grow down into our hearts, the more complete we will be through his power. And Paul says, when we're walking with Jesus, we lack nothing. By surrendering our hearts and giving all the glory to God, he is able to accomplish within us far more than we could ever ask or imagine. The power of the cross is not simply for the day we stand before God on the day of judgment. But the power of the cross is to find strength in the daily battles that we face here on earth. Do you know where those battles are won? Right here in our heart. That's where they're fought. That's where they're won. And so I invite you to respond to the Spirit's promptings by praying at the cross this morning, right over there. As we sing our, our, our closing song, you can make your way to the cross. If you'd like, someone would pray for you. They will pray with you. God gives us warning signs, and God gives us promptings. And so I urge you to respond to his voice today and stop living in secret and find someone that you can, you can confess to and they can hold you accountable. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this day, Father's Day. And, and Lord, I thank you for the fathers, the dads that we have that, that have set a great example for us, Lord. But most of all, you and Jesus set the example for us to follow. And I pray that we would follow in your footsteps and in your light. God, um, you know, when we think of secrets, we think of addicts. But the truth is probably many of us are doing things that we don't want anyone to know about. We want to cover it up. We want to hide it. Lord, it's not only, only eating away at us. It's destroying our relationships, whether we know it or not, because we, we pull back. We, we keep our distance so no one finds out. So I pray that this morning your spirit would work on us in a mighty way and draw us to the cross of Christ, that we would repent, we would find forgiveness, and we would find new hope through Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.